He's going to give us the latest update. All right. Yes, since it's been 10 years. Um, I, uh, yes, unlike all the previous talks here, which have been about something, this is just sort of uh, a cataloging of what we've been up to lately. Um, so quickly, for those of you who uh, have not run across us, uh, basically we were an outcome of the, the 1992 decision to privatize control of the internet. Um, we were formed as a nonprofit organization to provide support to critical internet infrastructure. Uh, the internet was 24 years old already at that point, and there were parts of it that nobody could see a clear way to uh, having a, a for-profit business model. So we're sort of like the fire department that way. We go and deal with things because if you let them burn down, then pretty soon everything's on fire. Um, so basically, we work on supporting exchange points, supporting the core of the domain name system, uh, regulatory and policy stuff for governments, and cybersecurity coordination. We're the first member of the server and so forth. Um, we're providing DNS services at uh, 276 exchanges, um, uh, including here in Tampa, uh, but not yet Helsinki, so that's... Hold it closer. Sorry, but not yet Helsinki, so that is an area where we could improve. Um, we're doing um, TLD DNS for 120 countries, uh, including Finland, um, we're also doing the DNSSEC key management for 25. Um, the current work there, we're, we've got um, three operational vaults. So the vault has inside a, a SCIF, and there's an IPS inside that, an information protection system. And then there's a, a hardware HSM, and then there's a the TPS inside that. So basically there are sort of five layers of physical security in each of those locations. Um, and the Zurich one is inside a nuclear bomb shelter uh, under a bank. Um, and so we're overhauling the Zurich one this year. Uh, it was discovered that the locks that are used, uh, there's a failure mode in one of the servos that actuates the lock mechanism, and so we're in the process of replacing all of those servos proactively so that we don't run into the same problem that ICANN did when they had to uh, call a locksmith to drill out their safe. Um, uh, so one of our guys went and got certified as a Cabo Moss locksmith uh, so that he could get the restricted access tools and all that. Um, we are refactoring our signer code. Uh, because we started doing all this back in like 2006, 2007, uh, all of our DNSSEC code predates any of the uh, commonly available and commonly used stuff now. Uh, we are also using not, we are also using OpenDNSSEC. Uh, but all of our production stuff is on our own code. Uh, so we're, you know, working on probably, you know, <laughs> moving off of our own stuff and, and on to uh, a more common open source uh, thing. We're also, um, won't, probably won't be this year, probably next year, but uh, we're going to probably build a fourth facility in Montevideo, uh, Uruguay. Um, Largely, this is about uh, making the countries that we're doing this for happy that their key material is in a place where it will be respected by the host country. And I'll get back to that in a, a few more slides on. Um, something we've been working on for upwards of 20 years is helping countries repatriate control of their CCTLDs. And, um, so we've done seven or eight of those over the last 22 years. Um, and 
there are currently 13 that are not, well, it's a little bit better than that now, of, of, but as of, as of two weeks ago, there were 13 uh, countries in Africa that didn't have control of their own CCTLDs. And so we're doing a joint project with Smart Africa, which is a um, African continental intergovernmental organization that focuses on ICT improvement uh, to, to do outreach to all of these. Um, ICANN has also, I mean, ICANN has to be very careful because they're neutral, but ICANN has provided very good support to countries that uh, want to develop their skills and get to the point where they can retake control over, over the stuff. Um, we did get Gabon uh, in conjunction with uh, uh, AFNIC, the French uh, CCTLD uh, operator. We got that done uh, about a week and a half ago. Um, Central African Republic, Mali, Gambia, and Guinea are all in process right now. Um, not yet, not yet in process in the sense of like a, a change having been submitted to the IANA, but in process in the sense of uh, registry software is up and running and is populated with some or all of the registry data and there's testing happening and uh, you know people are getting ready to submit uh, requests. Um, okay, uh, there's a, a fairly large project that we're doing um, in support of the OECD. So the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development is, uh, after World War II, there was the Marshall Plan for rebuilding Europe. And the Marshall Plan then got split into a military and a civilian component. The military component became NATO, the civilian component became the OECD. They, they both wound up growing slightly different sets of member countries. The OECD is 38 member countries. Um, Anyway, uh, so we do a lot of work with the OECD and have for a long time. And one of the problems that they have is that, like the ITU, they've been very dependent upon member country contributed data for their data sets. So the OECD's whole shtick is um, using data to drive qualitatively better policy management. So if member countries want to do a better job of regulating telecommunications or a better job of creating legislation about you know, how the internet should work or whatever, that that should be based in data rather than based in you know, political whim. And so the problem is if they're not working from good data, then garbage in, garbage out. And when they're dependent upon the countries, give them data about how the internet is going, those countries often have an incentive to try and make themselves look good in public rankings. And the countries themselves, the national governments, are often depending upon phone companies to give them data. And those companies, likewise, are you know, primarily concerned with making themselves look good. And so you wind up with this sort of inverse tree of aggregating statistics where the bottom of the tree is a whole lot of competing companies all wanting to make themselves look good and each one using a completely different methodology for collecting data. And so it's pretty hard not to wind up with garbage uh, at the end of that process. And so what the OECD has been trying to do is get more to the point where they can collect their own data using uniform methodology globally um, that they can defend, right? And that won't be subject to influence by people trying to, to contribute <laughs> data that makes them look good. So what this project is, um, is very sparse sampling, like one flow out of every million at internet exchange points, because basically, most packets wind up going through exactly one internet exchange point, so this is a, a mechanism for avoiding double counting. Um, and then, you know, academics can argue about whether the packets that don't traverse an exchange point are somehow, you know, different 
than the ones that do, whether sampling from exchange points rather than sampling on somebody's private cross-connect gives you a somehow biased view. Most people who looked at this and don't have themselves a biased view that they are trying to promulgate have have come to the determination that this is probably a pretty good proxy. It's a pretty good way of figuring out what's going on to look at the traffic exchanges. Um, so uh, that data then gets boiled down to a matrix of um, flow volume uh, and protocol on a country to country basis and on an AS to AS basis. Um, so this has been in sort of beta test since the beginning of this year. Um, the code is all written by SWITCH, which is the Swiss Research and Education Network. Uh, it is based on code that they've had in operation for 10 years uh, on the, the Swiss uh, research backbone. Uh, it's open source code. There are several independent uh, code reviews happening right now to produce uh, reports on the, the privacy and security of the code. Uh, there are several legal reviews happening of the uh, privacy implications of doing all this. Um, uh, and then PCH is uh, handling the, the actual deployment, right? So, Switch writes the code, we deploy it, uh, the data gets then published by the OEC uh, as a public data set, open to everyone, no cost, no licensing terms or anything like that. So that all, uh, it, it, it's really aimed more than anything else at economic researchers. Uh, and so, yes, here is, uh, this is not like live data, this is from a couple weeks ago or something. This is one day in the life of South Africa um, because we've got pretty good coverage in South Africa. Uh, it, it's the, the main location for the beta test. Um, so over the course of the day, what you're seeing here is about 75% of the bandwidth produced in exchange points in South Africa is consumed in South Africa. Um, You've got a fair bit going to uh, neighboring countries. You've got the ex-colonial oppressor up here with whom there's a bit of language and culture shared. There's the US that's always got to be part of everything. And then along early in the morning, <laughs> Korea winds up using a fair bit of South African bandwidth. Not clear why. Um, but there it is. That's you know an interesting thing that we didn't actually know before. Um, uh, this is something PCH has been wanting to do. We started, we started on this once already back in 2003, and at that time, flow collection wasn't really a thing yet. Sampling wasn't really a thing yet. None of this was built into switches, and there were just too many problems. And so now, coming back to it again, uh, 20 years later, it turns out that it's actually a much more tractable problem. So that's the thing that we're doing, and uh, you know, as soon as we have all the privacy stuff together, we'll be sort of making rounds of exchange operators and saying, "Hey, do you want to participate?" Um, okay. Another thing that we've been working on is helping people with tools to take back control of their social media content. Um, so uh, we've been supporting a bunch of Fediverse uh, open source projects. And the, the one that's completely new is uh, one that's called, the project's called Big Buffet. Um, it is essentially a, um, read-only interface for uh, uh, Fediverse content so that like a corporate website or whatever could put up um, uh, something that looks like a, a blog, right? But that is, on the back end, is just their regular Fediverse 
content and, and management system. It, it's not a big deal, but helping helping mainstream all this, uh, we think, is going to be one of the steps that will get it more to where it needs to be. Yeah. Is that a piece of software or is it a site? That is software. That is software. You have to write it yourself. Uh, yes. Yeah, so it's it's a uh, all right. So. Um, all of the stuff like Mastodon has a front-end, back-end separation. It is garbage from a <laughs> protocol perspective. It is garbage from a software design perspective. It is truly, truly awful. But it does have this separation that you can use. So what this is, is a different front-end that is read-only, that does a bunch of parsing, and is super, super configurable from a CSS perspective and can run inside another website. So you can throw up your, your regular website and then just drop this in and have, uh, it uses a double hashtagging mechanism. So you can put filters, you can configure filters that will look for a double hashtag in the content and then you can use the double hashtag to tell it, you know, show this, don't show this, whatever. Um, and then all the double hashtags get pulled out. But the main thing is, on a corporate website, if you want to look like something specific, you can just drop this in and have it look the way you want without, anyway. It's, it's you know, in beta, we're, we're grinding along on it. Uh, there are a bunch of other things that we've been supporting, um, tools that, uh, help you uh, reclaim content that you might have already previously posted on the website that uh, you no longer want to participate in, for instance. And there are quite a few different websites like that. So that's kind of an ongoing project as people get interested and you know, discover that, oh, I had content on Flickr, for instance, that I want to reclaim. Um, so a bit of that. Another project, um, we uh, are, this is our 30th anniversary, and we are becoming a international treaty organization instead of just an NGO. We've, for 30 years, been an NGO, a non-governmental organization that is uh, headquartered in San Francisco and is just a California not-for-profit corporation. So, like ICANN, for instance, is also a California not-for-profit corporation. Um, that means that it's subject to California law, U.S. law, um, but also it means that it's not held to account under those laws, exactly, um, because, for instance, Europe has privacy law, and the U.S. basically doesn't. Uh, California makes some pretense of it, but then, you know, when push comes to shove, nothing happens. So, um, anyway, uh, we got a couple of sort of unsolicited uh, invitations from the Netherlands and Switzerland to uh, move to The Hague or Geneva, um, and of those, the Swiss offer was quite good, and we've been pursuing it, but picking up a 30-year-old organization with a lot of logistics and operations and a warehouse and forklifts and trucks and shelving and blah, 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 is its own project. And so they, um, they're making an offer to cover all that, but they have a host state act, the law that governs how they interact with organizations in their country. And that requires us to be an intergovernmental organization um, before August 28th, which is the date that they scheduled us for their parliamentary hearing that is also required to approve the offer. And so, maybe by August 28th, we'll have a fifth signature and we'll be an official intergovernmental organization and then we'll like rebrand our website from pch.net to pch.in. Um, we'll see. Or maybe it won't happen. We'll, we'll find out. Come, come the end of the summer, we'll, we'll see. Um, what else? We've been 
gradually working on carbon and energy balancing. Uh, our carbon balancing scheme basically is to get off of energy sources that uh, <laughs> generate carbon uh, and reduce our, uh, our aircraft uh, travel footprint. Um, we've been doing uh, tree planting stuff for the, uh, the to cover the, the travel part of that, um, but mostly we've been trying to reduce the travel and do video conferences instead. Uh, the other thing we've been doing is uh, for all of our employees now, we will cover the top of their house with solar panels. And so we've been finding most of those projects run between about uh, $30,000 and $60,000 each. Um, but then, uh, you know, it generates a fair, about, fair amount of electricity um, and it's sort of nice and permanent and it's a good perk for the employee and dumps solar power back into the grid. We are nowhere near balancing out know, uh, the power consumed by servers in 275 locations Then it's a race and we're losing the race. But, uh, you know, having the project is better than not having the project and it gives us something to talk with potential donors about. Uh, so, <clears throat> you know, we're doing that. Um, doing a lot of supporting of other organizations. So there's the OECD. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work with the, the ICRC, Red Cross, over the last year. Um, when Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, and then Microsoft was found to be doing intelligence stuff for Ukraine, and then subsequently found to be breaking the um, sanctions and doing the same thing for Russia, uh, and the ICRC folks came to a realization that uh, Microsoft Azure was where most of their data was being held, and that included like medical and family records for lots and lots and lots of people, and that Microsoft also had crypto keys for, <laughs> that they were managing for the ICRC, and that it wasn't just Microsoft, there were a whole bunch of other organizations. They did kind of a survey, found that they had 190 um, different ICT service provider organizations that they were depending on. And so they spun up a whole separate project that's incorporated in Luxembourg that is just doing, um, it, it, it's just focused on making them uh, independent of external service providers, getting back to the level of self-sufficiency that organizations had 30 years ago. Uh, and this is exactly the kind of thing that we like. And so we've been working with them a lot in sort of a project management role to help with that. Um, do a bunch of work with the World Bank, mostly kind of sanity checking their projects because they're always uh, you know, doing these huge projects and then somebody says, oh, but what about ICT? We should have an ICT aspect to that. And then they say, oh, well, uh, that means that we need to do a feasibility white paper. And the feasibility white paper will go out to bid and $250,000 will go to somebody who doesn't know anything about ICT to write a paper. And uh, yeah, but you could have actually solved the problem for 20,000. Okay. So a bunch of that. Same thing for the Asian Development Bank. Center for Humanitarian Dialogue, um, they do conflict resolution. They're a fairly large nonprofit. They're like 500 people based in London. Uh, they negotiate when there is armed conflict, but we've been working with them for about five years now, uh, helping them get their uh, cyber conflict uh, group spun up. Um, recently working with Universal Postal Union, they want to be able to provide email hosting in developing countries for their members. Uh, there's the outages.net mailing list and the website and wiki and all that. Many of you are probably subscribed to. We've been hosting forever. Uh, and a whole lot of other sort of little open source projects. Um, so just as one example of like the breadth of stuff that we've been doing for the Red Cross, uh, they need 
little containers that they can give their staff when their staff need to have a private conversation with somebody so that they can like pop their phone and the phone of the person they want to have the conversation with into a little box and then walk away and have a conversation. Um, and then know that like $3,000 worth of phone isn't getting stolen, so there's a little pocket outside the RF containment thing, but inside the plastic for uh, an air tag and you know, a place to like put an ID card on the outside. I don't know, uh, but this is this is a photograph of one of the first generation prototypes that came back from a uh, factory, and we're on third generation prototypes now. Um, but you know, like this is just completely different sort of uh, project. Uh, then there's Quad Nine, which. Some of you use, not very many, uh, as Ellen uh, <laughs> pointed out in his statistics earlier, but it is a. At least a, you were on the statistics. What? At least you were on the statistics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the smallest of the big four. Uh, uh, so it is the smallest of the big four, but it is the one that is GDPR compliant. So it does not collect data about who's doing what queries. Um, and also it provides. Uh, malware blocking. So, um, depending who's doing the test and how big a test they run, uh, it is somewhere between about 80 and about 97 percent effective uh, on malware blocking. Um, you'll find uh, other things that claim to do malware blocking more down in the sort of 10 percent to 40 percent range. Uh, that is often due to conflict of interest. Like if you have a company that claims that they're doing malware blocking, but then they're in the business of selling hosting and DDoS protection for people who are publishing malware, you can see how they might not want to block their own customers, and so that accounts for you know that 50% difference in effectiveness. Um, there are about 5 million domains blocked at any time with about a 10% daily turnover. Um, and then, I mean, by most measures, the, 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 the gauge of success is how many times do we prevent somebody from getting infected with malware or uh, a, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, ransomware, things like that. And that's now several hundred million times a day. So that's good. Um, uh, John, who runs this, gave me a couple other slides here. So this is, right, so this is the node here in Tampere. Uh, this is blocks per day. Uh, so there was a day in May there where there were a million malware infections blocked just right here in Tampere. Um, and then, what's this one? This is, uh, yeah, so where traffic served in Tampere is being, is originating, and this is by AS, and so, yeah, it's, it's mostly finished, uh, mostly finished traffic that's showing up here, so good localization and sane routing. Um, uh, all right. So I think that's, yeah, that's it. Anybody have any questions? Sorry, that was kind of a big laundry list and I ran over time. My apologies. Thank you for that, Bill. All right. Hi, guys. Yeah. Do we have any questions, Bill? Will you be staying for dinner? Uh, that doesn't yes, count. Yes, staying for dinner. Uh, Mount Sona, 5 o'clock flight at AM. So. Yeah. Hi, uh, Wilhelm from uh, Via Europa in Sweden. Uh, first of all, let me say I'm a big fan of what you do. Uh, I feel like you're one of the um, uh, giants in the background, making sure the internet works, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, but I'm kind of curious, how are you financed? Uh, you're you're not for profit, but yeah. yeah. Uh, so if you go to our website and look under about, uh, Donors, I think it is. Um, uh, you'll see that our largest donors are 
NTT, uh, Equinix, Cisco, um, uh, and but we've got a lot of donors. There are roughly uh, 40 governments and about 800 companies. And the interesting thing, though, is that 99% um, of that, it holds fairly steady, about 99% of that is in kind rather than cash. So it is data center space, fiber, um, servers, uh, power, remote hands, all that. Um, and that's what we need in order to provide services. Um, the 1% of cash is really helpful also because that covers salaries and shipping and um, airfares and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's about um, uh, $300 million a year uh, overall with about $3 million in cash. Cool, thanks. Any other questions? If you ask questions, you don't have to listen to me do the next talk. Just saying. <laughs>